on spiritual warfare. And next Sunday is the first Sunday in Lent. It's also uh, move the clocks ahead to daylight savings time. And uh, so it will feel like an hour earlier as you get here. Um, but we're going to be looking at that during Lent. And I want to encourage you to take special time during Lent to read more scripture, to pray, to fast, to pursue God, to follow hard after God. And it's a, just a great time of the year to do it. It's not at Christmas time or family vacation. It's a perfect time to really say, I'm going to set aside the TV set. I'm going to listen more to Caleb. I'm going to listen more to Air One or the other stations and really do some serious work that other times of year you're so busy doing this and that, you can't quite do it. This is the time. And so as we look at spiritual warfare, look at the battle that we're all in, um, I just want to encourage you to take special time to do that. Today's the last one. I want to look at the promises that God gives us about heaven. And there's so many good ones. The classic book on this is a book by Randy Alcorn. Big, huge volume all about heaven that is absolutely fabulous. That's the classic work. But I just want to give you five things, five promises. There are 105 or uh, 1,005, I don't know, but there are a lot of promises about heaven. But I want to give you five of them that give me encouragement day in and day out. They come out of your Bible. What is the Bible? Basic instructions before leaving earth. So this is what the Bible is. It's your instructions while you're here. You don't need it in heaven. You don't have to carry it around in heaven. You'll be before Jesus. But we want to get the instructions God gives us about heaven. 80% uh, of people believe in heaven. That's a national statistic. 70% of people believe they're going there. And then here's my favorite one. 30% say, I know someone who's not going there. They're just not going. Now, don't look at the person next to you, okay? Don't look at them and say, that's you, pal. There is an innate sense in every person that there's something more. By nature of being a pastor, I hang around a lot of funerals. People come up to me. They come alive at funerals. Everybody believes in heaven. They've got stories of wild things that happen that they prove to them, that show them that. And I get so excited. And then a month later, they won't give me the time of day. And uh, heaven, heaven, who cares about that? There's a great book um, that Don Richardson, the missionary, uh, wrote called Eternity in Their Hearts. It's from Ecclesiastes 311, where it says, God has placed eternity in every heart. That's why all of us, before somebody even said, we believed there was something there. What he does is, as a missionary, he's aware of all these different cultures. He goes back into culture after culture after culture and shows how they all believe that there is going to be another life. They also believe there's this book and there, there was this flood and that there was this Adam and Eve kind of person. They have different names, but it sounds very similar. And so he traces that, how God all over the world has put eternity in the hearts, even in Iran and terrible places where there's harsh persecution. God's giving people visions of heaven, visions of um, of different parts of the Bible. In China, under terrible persecution, one of the missionaries I met um, at a conference had somebody come up and said, what's the marriage supper of the Lamb? Now, how in the world would he know about Revelation chapter 19 that talks about this when he's been persecuted, no Bible, nothing, and he comes up and goes, what's the marriage supper of the Lamb? What's going on with that? By the way, we're going to look at Revelation in... Uh, a couple of months, we're going to look at some of those things. So anyway, God has put it inside of our hearts. We're aware that it's there, but it's sure fun. Here's Evan Alexander. He's a neurosurgeon. He operates on your brain out of Harvard. He works out of Harvard. He works out of uh, Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, there's another one, Brigham and Women's Hospital. He works out of all of those. He's a neurosurgeon. He got meningitis. He was out of it. They thought they had lost him due to the meningitis. 
he had this wild experience of heaven. Do you know he lost some privileges because he just said, I believe in heaven. I believe there's something more. He published a book. It spent 98 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list of it. There's another great movie and book called Heaven is for Real. We've talked about this many different times about uh, little Colton Burpo who had his appendix burst and they thought they had lost him. They thought he was gone. And he didn't talk much about that experience, but when he came back, he said, Daddy, how come you were so mad? I saw you over in this room. Well, he's on this uh, operating table. How in the world could he see his dad in the chapel of the hospital throwing chairs around the room? Daddy, how come you were so mad throwing chairs around the room? Mommy, why were you on the phone talking to Grandmom and crying? What was going on? And then later on, uh, how come you didn't tell me I had a sister? You've got a sister. She's right there. No, another sister, an older sister, older than me. How come you didn't tell me? How did you know about that, Colton? I met her in heaven. He just talks like that, like that great movie if you want to watch it. I think it's very, very powerful. It tells us about this. In the uh, Baptist church I was in in Clifton Park, there's a cemetery connected with it. And in the several different times on the tombstone, it says what this says, as you are now, so once I was, as I am now, so you will be. All of us, you can Google it. The mortality rate's roughly around 100%. You can Google it. You can check it. Check it. Make sure it's accurate. Everybody's going to die. The people in the grave, they were just like us. And someday, we're going to be just like them. So it says, so prepare for death and follow me. Somebody else wrote a follow-up. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> and so we got to, you don't want to just follow anybody. You want to know which way they uh, went and how it worked out for them. All righty. Well, let's look at the scriptures here. This is going to be very simple, five simple promises. Please take notes in your bulletin. I want you to have this assurance. Knowledge of heaven allows martyrs to stand under withering persecution in North Korea, in China, where Google and Facebook and others are helping the Chinese government persecute horribly not only the Christians but the Muslims that are just being clobbered. If you just click on there, uh, I care about Allah or Mohammed, they've got you. And they're going to come after you, and you're going to be taken away to a re-education camp. And uh, so these sorts of truths that I'm going to share with you today have given people incredible strength. When they're surrounded, as we sang about earlier, and you find out, I'm not surrounded by the enemy. I'm surrounded by God. I'm surrounded by his angels. People from these simple truths I'm going to share with you have been able to undertake incredible pain knowing that this life isn't all that there is. There is so much more. In fact, this is kind of the prelude. This is the, the warm-up. This is the preview, a little bit of preview, and this is a time of testing where you're going to be tested and God's going to find out and you're going to find out what's in your heart by how you respond to the various tests that every single person in this room is going through some kind of test right now in some way. And the question is, how will we respond? So let's look together. This is God's inerrant, infallible, and all-sufficient word. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Why would their hearts be troubled? Because Jesus has just said, I'm going away. I'm going to leave. I've been with you. I'm going away. They're troubled. All of us are troubled in some way. He's saying, with this stuff, I'm going to be sharing with you. You don't have to be troubled because your biggest problem has been solved. You have a relationship with God, and you're going to live forever. No matter what gets thrown in your face in this life, your biggest problem is solved. So do not let your hearts be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, believe in me too. If you're just a nice leader, you don't say believe in me. I don't say to you, believe in me. I say believe in God. I'm fallible. Jesus is the Son of God. My Father's house. This is something that is real. His house. It's a physical place. We'll talk about that. It isn't just an altered consciousness. It isn't just in my mind I'm imagining and I like to think this and I have beautiful thoughts. There is a physical house. My father's house has many rooms. That's again speaking of a physical, real place, not something I imagine. There is a house. It's got rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place? And we'll talk about that in a second. I'm preparing, Jesus said, a, here we go again, a place. So it's a house. It has rooms. It's a place. This is a real place. Again, not an imagination, not something we think up in our minds, something ethereal, we kind of float around here. There is a house with rooms and a place according to the Bible. Not according to what I think, according to what the Bible says. And if I go and prepare a place, there it is again for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. He's coming back for each and every one of you to take you to a place where you can be with me. And that's the key part is you're going to be with Jesus, surrounded by wave after wave of his love, as we sang about this morning. That you may also be where I am. Where I am is a place. You know the way to, there it is again, the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? If some of you are here searching for the Lord and you feel like, boy, I'm not quite understanding all this. I want you to see today, you're not the first one. Thomas has been with Jesus for three and a half years and he doesn't get it. If you're searching for God and it's not just clicking, everybody else seems to know all about it, and I, I'm having trouble getting the... You're not the first one. You're in good company. There have been lots of other people before you that have been seeking, and it doesn't connect. The first time I read the Bible, what in the world is this? I read it, didn't understand it. I read the words. I didn't comprehend the words. And it's after reading it again and again and again that this slow brain kind of kicks in. Oh, I see. Oh, 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 I get that. It doesn't all happen in five minutes. So Thomas is saying, Lord, we don't know where you're going. He just told him, I'm taking you to a place. We're going to heaven. I'm going to bring you there. So how can we know the way? Now, this is so important. This is one of the most important verses in the Bible. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me or Mohammed or uh, uh, Buddhism, Buddha. Does it say that? No. He's saying, I'm the way. It comes through me. I didn't write this. I didn't say, let's make our club exclusive, cut out a little bit of the competition and see what we can do to get everybody over in our camp. This is what Jesus, second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, this is what he said. And it's our job to take this to others, not just sit there and go, well, that's the way it is. Our job, knowing this, is to say, we need to go to the Dominican Republic. We need to go and support churches as you uh, did last August, where you guys were responsible for churches all over the world being built. No one comes to the Father except through me.
Well, I've got a very sad, sad story. I hope you have a tissue to dab your eyes because this is a very sad story. Here, this man had a terrible, terrible heart condition. And he went to the doctor with this terrible, terrible heart condition. And the doctor said, whew, this is a terrible, terrible heart condition. And uh, he said, you stay here. I need to talk to your wife for just a second. So he took her in the other room, and she, he said, he's got a terrible, terrible heart condition. In fact, he's going to die, but he does have one chance. If you can take him home, make him just sit there and relax in front of the TV, watch any sports, anything he wants to watch, detective shows. If you could feed him three times a day, don't argue with him, don't nag him, don't bug him. He needs to just sit there, and you cater to him for about a year. And then I think he can make a full recovery. So she said, okay. And so they're driving home, and the husband said, what did the doctor say to you? She goes, you're going to die. <laughs> so anyway, people do die. Three people every second are dying. By the time we finish this service, 11,000 people will have died. What happens then? If you've got your outline right there, I want you to get these five things. And again, there's so much more. Uh, this book on heaven is phenomenal, and it has so much more to share about all the things we'll be doing in heaven, uh, et cetera, the laughter, the fun, the uh, sports, the uh, creativity, the study. There's a big universe out there for us to study and have a great time for all of eternity and not be bored. Heaven is an actual place. Again and again, I showed you those verses, those words that talk about it's a place, and I'm preparing a place. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place? The word, the Greek word is topos, from which we get topographical, you know, a topographical map of something. It's a place. That's what it is. It's a real, legitimate place. Again, not something we think up in our mind. Um, and we go there immediately. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The thief, this day, the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, you're not in the final heaven, there's a new heaven and a new earth that's going to be built. So this is the pre preparation. It'll be good. It'll be fine. You don't need to worry about it. It'll be just absolutely fabulous. Because um, he's building that new heaven, new earth. That's in Isaiah 65. It's in uh, Revelation 22. Now, the big question everybody wants, and it's probably be the only thing you'll remember today, so uh, you've got to get this one. Will my dog be in heaven? Everybody wants to know that. And I've got good news for those of you who have dogs. We know that dogs are perfect, amen? And heaven is perfect, okay? So all dogs will be in heaven because it's a perfect place. Now, I don't have very good news for people with cats. We know cats are not perfect. They're not making it. No cats. Heaven is only perfect. Do you know the difference between a dog and a cat? Uh, a dog, you whistle, come here, come here. And they come and sit right there. You say to the cat, come here. In its good old time, it will come over and it has the audacity to say, you're sitting in my seat. So that's the difference. That's why, no. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what will happen to dogs. We know one thing for sure is that animals will be in heaven. There are animals. The Bible describes that. I, I don't know. It doesn't say what happened to Fido and how they uh, ended up. But there is a new heaven and earth. This idea of a home, this kind of reminds me it's about half, the, I mean, double the size of the home I grew up in. And I have so many wonderful memories of wrestling around and having fun, playing in the backyard, um, uh, and this is going to be a place where you're going to go home to this place, but it's going to be a place of good memories, not of 
bad memories because it's a place where there's eternal happiness. Secondly, heaven is being prepared by Christ for you. It took six days to make the present earth. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place. How beautiful, how amazing is the new heaven, the new earth, if Jesus has been working on it for 2,000 years. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going, to, I'm going there to prepare a place? It's still not done. It's going to be absolutely incredible. I told you about the little vacation that Cheryl and I had at the Turks and the uh, Caicos Islands and how beautiful the water was. Watch out for barracudas right about back there. But they're great, uh, great, beautiful. If that's how beautiful... It is now how much more beautiful will the new heaven, the new earth that has had so much more time to work on than this one. Here's what Paul says. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. We can't even fathom it. I can't put it into words. I've never been there. I don't know how to describe it. I just know what the Bible says, that it's incredible. It is absolutely incredible. It's beyond anything I can even imagine of what it's going to be like. Number three, heaven is a place where I will be with Jesus. This is such an important part of it. Uh, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that where that you also may be where I am. God will not force you to go to heaven. If you don't want to be with Jesus, um, C.S. Lewis put it so well. He said, um, as a follower of Jesus, we say to God, thy will be done. But if we don't want to have anything to do with Jesus, at our death, God says, thy will be done. In other words, you don't want to be with him. You will not be forced to be with him. You'll be in hell for all of eternity rather than in heaven. And just as uh, heaven is more beautiful than you can ever imagine, hell is far worse than the worst possible thought you could have of what it will be like. It's worse than that. I want to encourage you to get to know Jesus, to spend time during Lent, spend extra time and say, I need to get to know Jesus. I'm going to read a chapter a day of the Gospel of John. I'm going to read the book of Romans. I'm going to do this extra thing. I'm going to put praise music on um, first thing in the morning and, and begin the day with praise music. Take it as a special time to get to know Jesus. Of course, all year you're doing that, but make it a special time during Lent, which begins next Sunday. Um, little Colton, uh, they showed him a picture of Jesus, and he said, no, that's not him. Well, what does Jesus look like? He has markers. What? What are you talking about? He has red markers. That's how you know him. When you see him, he's got red mark. What are you talking about? Turns out he was talking about Jesus' hand where he had had his, uh, been nailed to the cross. And they were still red, he said. And it was a reminder to everyone of the love that Jesus has for each one of us so that for all of eternity, we can never forget that love we're reminded because he has the red markers. 1 John 3, John writes, See what great love, and we sang about this this morning, see what great love the Father has lavished. Lavish doesn't mean a little teaspoon of it, you know, kind of in a stingy manner, handing it out. 
He's lavishing it. The word literally means spilling over. He has love spilling over on us. So we see the red markers, as Colton called them, but we are lavished. His love is spilling over that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We are his children. That's why I want you spending time with him. Some of you grew up with someone or uh, had a relationship with someone who was emotionally unavailable. They, they intended well, but they're so wrapped up in their hurt or their pain or their life, uh, their busyness, uh, the urge to make money, to be consumed with pleasure, to do this or that, that they were just emotionally unavailable. Again, they kind of tried, but they just weren't there. The lights were on, but nobody was home. That's not the way God is. That's not the way Jesus will be for all of eternity. He wants you to be where he is. He wants to be with you. Mark 13, 27, this just shows you how big heaven is and some of what we'll be able to do. Then he will send his angels all around. This is at the time of Christ's return, at the end of the earth's history. When Christ returns, he will send his angels all around the earth. Okay, we're good with that. To gather his chosen people from every part of the earth. Everybody still good with that? Okay. He's going all over the earth. People who follow Jesus are scattered. And from every part of heaven. We're going to be exploring heaven. Why do you think the universe is so big? We're going to be exploring it. And he's going to have to call us not only from every part of earth, but from every part of heaven, which is huge. That's where we'll be. And who knows what we'll be doing. All we know is it's going to be better than we could ever imagine. You won't be bored in heaven. Somebody said, I was told by the pastor that the heaven is like a, a worship service that never ends. It just goes on and on and on. He said, as a 10-year-old, I wasn't inspired. Some of the adults know what he means. And some of them go on. You ever heard that song, I could sing of your love forever? That song goes on and on for all of eternity. So, anyway... It's going to be wonderful when we get there. Number four, Jesus is the way to heaven. As I've already alluded to in the last point, there's a place. We've talked about that. We've established. There's a person. I want to be with you. You don't get the place without the person. If you get the person, you get the place. They go Together. Don't say, I'm really interested in heaven, but I'm not that interested in Jesus. Take Lent and get to know the person so that when you get to heaven, you're enjoying the place and the person. You don't get there without uh, the person. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so make sure you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ because that's who you'll be with for all of eternity and spend time during Lent. Number five, you are personally invited to heaven. This isn't just a blanket invitation. You all come. Uh, anybody who's interested, come. Listen to how Jesus approached Martha as she was weeping over Lazarus who's died. He's going to be raised from the dead, but she's weeping, and she doesn't understand that yet. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. So he's saying, if you know me, your body will be dead someday but you will still be living with me after you have died. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. No, 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 everybody dies. We already talked about that. No. 
the real part of you, your soul, the real part, this carcass changes and is different. It's not the same as it was 10 years ago. But it's what's inside of you that's the real person. And that will never die. For all of eternity, you're going to be with Christ. Then he says, do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe it? He's personally inviting her to believe so that she can spend eternity with him. Today, Jesus is personally inviting you. You thought you just happened to be here today. God brought you here today to hear this. And he's inviting you into a relationship with him. Here's what it says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus, and he's talking about your heart. And he said, I'm standing on the door, at the door and knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, I'll eat with them, and they will be with me. Some translations say we'll be together forever. But literally it says they will be with me. Jesus wants you to be with him for all of eternity. This morning he's knocking. He's knocking at the door saying, open, please open the door. He won't force his way in. You have the choice. You've got the lever. You've got a free will. You can answer the knock, or you can say, no, I'm not interested. Go away. And Jesus will honor that. He's knocking today. Please say a yes and experience him and experience a little taste of heaven in this life. We get to experience a taste of heaven by so many wonderful miracles, so many wonderful things that God does. I told you a couple weeks ago how the last day of our vacation, my daughter Bethany miscarried the baby that she was carrying about 11 weeks along and how sad it was for her and for us. And I told you how a week ago, I asked, how you doing, honey? How you coming along? And she said, it's painful and that's okay. The hottest fires produce the strongest steel. And that was enough to make me float all week long just to hear her say that. Then I was asking her, talking to her this week, how you doing now? And here's what she told me. And I want you to see how God gives you a little taste of heaven ahead of time. God didn't need to do this, but he did it. She said, I had a dream where I saw a little boy. This is my daughter. This isn't somebody on TV, somebody in a book someplace, somebody you never heard of before. This is my daughter saying this. I had a dream where I saw a little boy, and I asked if he was the child I'd lost. And in my dream, I thought he was. So I'm feeling a little more closure. I have my clear promise for the future. And here's my favorite part. This is a part of my story. She didn't want this to be a part of her story. She didn't wish this to be a part of it. She didn't wish it for anybody else for it to be a part of their story. You didn't ask for the things going on in your life. But they're a part of your story. Well, I'd prefer to have a story without that. It's there, whether you like it or not. This is a part of my story and God will use it for good. Satan wants to use it to what? To destroy you, to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan allows, I mean, Satan wants to attack you continually. God will only allow it if somehow it can become a part of your story. And God will use it for good. C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia and it's six volumes and the, the uh, sixth book is called The Last Battle and at the very end they've gotten victory over uh, Satan in the, the story and it goes all their life at the very end in this world and all their adventures had only been the cover and the title page. 
Now at last, they're beginning chapter one of the great story. So what he's saying is, this life is just the cover of the book. This is just the title page. The real story begins when you get to heaven. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story. What are you going to do for all of eternity? Which no one on earth has read. Which goes on forever. In which every chapter is better than the one before. That's what God is offering you today. Eternity with him. It's a real place. It's a house. It's got rooms. We'll be together. There's a city. There's streets. There's rivers. There's animals. There are trees. It's a real place. And he's offering, not forcing, he's offering it to you. Reach up and grab it. Grab a hold of it right now. Would you grab that next step sheet that was inside of your bulletin? And if you look on the back of it, there are five questions there. The most important is the last one, number five. I want to begin with that one. The first one says, 